for 8.6, some of the territories that changed hands in the Treaty of Versailles. Remember, we have the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire prior to 1914. After 1919, lots of territories change ownership or identity. Uh, the big one that everyone remembers, thankfully, is Alsace-Lorraine. It, uh, before the war, had belonged to Germany because they had taken it during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. Um, and then France wants it back. So France regains Alsace-Lorraine. There is the Saar, that, that coal-rich, resource-rich territory in Germany that France gets control of for 15 years, which majorly boosts their economy. We've got Poland, used to be part of the German Empire, now independent. The city of Danzig used to be part of the German Empire, but now it is completely a free city. It belongs neither to Poland or to Germany, and Germany is not allowed to use the port, so that little extra ding for them. We have Czechoslovakia and Hungary, used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and now are these independent states. So the, the map changes significantly, um, and these new countries are, are possible, because land has been taken from the aggressor nations, especially Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Let's just check in with France quickly, because uh, we've been talking mostly about Germany. But France in the 1920s was probably a great place to be. And you see this if you've ever seen the film Midnight in Paris. This is just the booming cafe culture, jazz society, full of artists, writers, um, just a really vibrant place and time to be. Part of this is because the economy is really strong in, Pan in France at this time, especially compared to a lot of other places in the 1920s. Um, France certainly had to rebuild from the war because the war takes place mostly on French territory, but they gained all these new territories from Germany. They gained the Saar, they gained back Alsace-Lorraine. They are also getting those reparation payments. So whereas Germany is declining in their economic power, France is the benefactor of that. Even though things were going pretty well, they still in the back of their mind are considering, this has happened once, can it happen again? So from a military perspective, they want to build up their defenses. And their defenses they name the Maginot Line. It's a series of bunkers along the French-German border, because they're still nervous about Germany. They, even though we've got the League of Nations and the um, Kellogg-Briand Pact, we promise not to ever go to war, there still is that sort of under undercurrent of doubt. So France erects these massive bunkers, and if you look at the map, you can see here, right along that border with Germany, because Germany, that's who they're nervous about. That was the aggressor nation. They were the country to blame for everything. There are a few series of defenses along uh, Belgium and the Low Countries, but I always get a kick out of this, that France is so obsessed with Germany that they don't bother to remember how Germany got into France in 1914 through Belgium. And they'll do it once again in 1940. But that's a spoiler alert. So we will get to this sort of Hitler taking over territories. And we're calling it the progression of aggression. And I love that title because it just perfectly encapsulates what Hitler is do doing. He starts this in March 1936 with the Rhineland. If you remember, the Rhineland was part of Germany. It is still part of Germany, however, it has, been, it has been demilitarized because France is so nervous. So that means that um, the German military, a lot of the German government has removed itself from the Rhineland, even though there are still German citizens there, it still is technically part of Germany. The French are nervous about this buffer zone, and because they've had to remove, the Germans have had to remove so much from it, uh, Hitler sort of feels like it's, it's the unloved baby brother. He wants to rejoin, he wants to make the Rhineland fully part of Germany once again. And so in March of 1936, he sort of starts scooching into the Rhineland. Now this is a direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles. It was supposed to be demilitarized, there's supposed to be no sort of government interference in the Rhineland. But what Hitler is doing is he's trying to see if anyone else will notice. It's like in Finding Nemo when he's at the drop-off and he's not supposed to touch the butt. And he does. Hitler wants to see, will anyone make a, make a fuss over this? Will anyone call me out? 
and no one does. Because you got to remember, in the 1930s, the rest of the world is, for the most part, busy with their economic problems. They're focused on their own issues of unemployment and, and all the, the issues that surround that. And so this is what Hitler finds out. He finds out that no one's going to bother him, no one's going to call him out. So now he can begin to really make plans. These plans we really start to see come into fruition in March 1938 with Austria. Remember, Hitler is originally Austrian. And so he is able to argue that Austria is not a separate country, but it is very similar because I'm from Austria. In addition to that, the Austrian people, they're Aryan as well. They have the same culture, the same language. So this would not be a takeover, just like the Rhineland wasn't a takeover. We we're just um, taking advantage of a, what was already ours. With Austria, he calls it an Anschluss, a reunification, so that Germany and Austria should always have been together. We are the same culture, we speak the same language, we are the same people, essentially. Now, many people in Austria think this is a great idea. And when the German troops enter Austria, it is not with a violent invasion, but they are welcomed with open arms. There are parades and celebrations because Austria had been suffering like everyone else, and they see Hitler as the, the local boy made good who's come to help their economy and help their society as well. Now, not all Austrians loved it, um, but for the most part, it was a peaceful takeover and a reunification. So Captain von Trapp didn't like this idea so much because he is a proud Austrian, but many Austrians think this is a good idea because they will gain strength from allying with Germany. So he's taken back the, uh, the Rhineland. He has annexed or combined with Austria. And now the world's starting to take notice, especially when he talks about his next target, the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland, as you can see there in the cream, is this border region of Czechoslovakia. It is definitely in Czechoslovakia's borders. Um, the Czechoslovakia is a different culture, a different language. However, the Sudetenland region, the Sudeten region, is populated primarily, or with the majority, of ethnic Germans. So Hitler's saying, if, if the people there are German, if the blood is German, therefore the land should also be German. And Germany needs more of that space. We were so so cramped. We had all of our territory taken, so we're trying to regain this simply so that we can be Germany. And as he's saying this, the world takes note. They get a little bit nervous. Like, we understood the Rhineland. We understood Austria. But now, this is a totally separate culture and country, and we're not sure if we're, if we're comfortable with that happening. So this leads us to the Peace for Our Time project. It's an in-class project, and the only sort of work that you're producing is a homework assignment. So you're reading these documents together in class, trying to understand what is Hitler going to say? How is he going to argue that he should be able to take these territories? And then we have Neville Chamberlain, who was the British Prime Minister at the time. So he'll be trying to negotiate, trying to find a happy middle ground, because if he's just going to start taking territories, would that lead us to war? Nobody wants to go to war again. So as you read these documents, you're going to discuss, you're going to debate, and I want you to decide for yourself, did Neville Chamberlain do the right thing? Did they come to the right arrangement and agreement at the end of these discussions or not?